So um, good evening, everyone. Very nice to have you all here. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Suzanne Newcomb, and I'm representing the Aereo project. Um, and this is a five-year ERC project to look at the entanglements of yoga, Ayurvedic medicine, and Indian um, forms of longevity practices and Rasa Shastra, which is often translated as alchemy, although it's, it's maybe a problematic translation. And uh, my colleague, Christelle Barrois, is here. And our principal investigator, um, Dagmar Vujastic, is in Canada and unfortunately can't be here today. But this is a, has been a, we're, we're four years into the project, and it's been a, f a fantastic opportunity to explore some of the entanglements and um, distinctions between these different ways of thinking, um, techniques of practice, and um, manuscript transmissions. So they, we, we, it was a very ambitious project, looking at a thousand years of history. In fact, we're looking at even more than a thousand years of history, but in a very spotty way, um, with only three full-time members of staff. And, and I should say, um, Jason Birch did some very helpful work initially before he left to join Jim's project. Um, so. Um, one of the things, one of the kind of emerging strands when we're looking at a thousand years of overlaps between medical longevity and religious practices in South Asia and India. Um, yep. Oh, right. All right. I'll just keep talking and then you can get their, their, their things. Um, so I'll, I'll try to extend my introduction as much as possible. Um, uh, one of the interesting things is, is my colleagues are Sanskritists, and I, I primarily work in English. But it's clear that if you're actually going to understand the historical transmission of these practices that are either internal practices to do with um, manipulating the energies of the body for certain desired ends or for health, um, or also the, the kind of practices involving very charismatic physical elements like uh, mercury and cinnabar and, and all sorts of metals, that you've got to look at China and you've got to look at the Tamil literature. And these are things that are really um, not part of the dialogue. This is really just a, a scholarly dialogue that's just starting. So what I'm doing tonight is because we have the opportunity to have two really um, esteemed experts in their respective fields is to try to start a, a kind of exploratory dialogue and, and what are some of the um, historic... Well, I, I, I'm not entirely sure what they're going to talk about, to be honest. Um, but, but three main themes that interest me are the kind of sparse knowledge of the historical context, the trade route overlaps, um, where, how did ideas transfer between cultures in very different worldviews and social understandings, and also just, just the materials, particularly in, in Mercury and, and these m rather rare materials. What, and I don't know that we'll get there, but that's just a really open and important question when you're, when you're looking at how these pro practices were transmitted and, and what they were thought to do. Um, another important theme is, is that of kind of the technical terminology. When, when people are looking at the old text, what do these terms actually mean? And it's often not easy to figure out. Um, and they often have slightly different nuances depending on the traditions. And then we've got these um, reconstructionist revival of the traditions, which um, both of our esteemed speakers can, can kind of speak to in various ways. But they, they give us some understanding of what happened historically, um, but it, it's very much a exploratory, really open-ended discussion. Um, the, the kind of merging of the idea that maybe Taoism and, and Indian esoteric practices have some kind of similarity w was kind of voiced in the 1950s and 1960s, particularly um, in some of the French journal as Asiatique. Um, and there was, there was kind of some, a few articles that really paralleled the practices and, and, and raised ideas that if you were just to read the summaries at that time, they might even be the same thing, which they're obviously very much not. So we've got, um, uh, most of you have heard Jim Allenson before, who's, who's running the Hatha Yoga Project and who's an, uh, a very esteemed philologist, um, as well as a um, initiated um, practitioner in a North order. And uh, Louis Komjati, we were very 
happy to welcome from San Diego, who's one of the very few um, sinologists who works on Taoism and is also um, a practitioner of, of internal alchemy. And he studies both um, the texts as well as the kind of emerging field of contemplative studies, which, which is more popular in America um, than is been established in Britain now. So the format tonight is going to be 20 minutes uh, starting with Lewis and then 20 minutes starting with Jim. And then um, I'll invite them to ask some questions of each other. And I might ask a few questions based on the, uh, the Ario project's interests. And then hopefully we'll have time for a discussion and, and we can see what's of interest to the audience in this kind of very initial interview. OK, so I will turn over to Lewis. Um, and let him um, speak. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, hello and welcome. I want to thank Suzanne Newcomb, uh, Karen O'Brien Kopp, and also the SOAS Center of Yoga Studies uh, for the opportunity to speak to you today. So I'm going to be looking at this kind of question of alchemy and Taoism. Uh, the first thing I want to think about is some interpretive issues. Uh, so thinking about meditation as a comparative term applicable to Chinese traditions, which I see it as such. Um, in Chinese, it tends to be talked about as da zuo, or to literally undertake sitting. Uh, in terms of the kind of comparative study of these things, I also want to think about tradition-specific terms. Uh, when I look at yoga applied to China and Taoism in particular, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, it's an Indian Sanskrit technical term that I don't see as applicable to Chinese traditions. Conventionally understood, if you think about postural yoga, um, the equivalent in Chinese culture is Taoyin um, or guided stretching, which um, in English language publications is also referred to as Chinese calisthenics or gymnastics traditions. Uh, Dao Yin is technically part of what's called Yangsheng practice or nourishing life, and this tends to be a kind of general category for health and longevity techniques. The earliest references to Yangsheng and Dao Yin date to the early Han Dynasty, so around the second century BCE. Uh, importantly, there's also a classical Taoist critique in chapter 15 of the Zhuangzi, this classical Taoist text, the Book of Master Zhuang where basically there's a critique of Dao Yin or Yangsheng practice in terms of um, apophatic meditation. So contentless, non-conceptual, and non-dualistic meditation as being the primary contemplative practice. Uh, but later, Yangsheng is incorporated into Taoism. So although engagement with Dao Yin and other so-called yogic parallels sometimes leads to claims about Indian influence, quote unquote, so here I'm thinking about specifically Joseph Needham and Victor Mayer, these are indigenous Chinese traditions. They predate the opening of the Silk Road around 110 BCE. Um, and then there's also this kind of question that Suzanne brought up about directional influences and even cross-pollination. So in The Alchemical Body by David Gordon White, he talks a little bit about this, specifically the kind of relative scarcity of cinnabar in a kind of indigenous and traditional Indian context. So where is cinnabar coming into Indian traditions? Um, so one of the things I'm trying to highlight here is that the Silk Road doesn't just go west to east. It goes east to west as well. Another question here is thinking about so-called Taoist yoga. So from my perspective, this relates to the history of ideas and intellectual history, including misconceptions and popular orientalist constructions of Taoism. Uh, Western scholars adopted alchemy, this term alchemy, to discuss indigenous Chinese traditions because they're parallels. So I see this as a legitimate category, which I'll talk about in a moment. There's the transmutation of substances and or the body. So this kind of discussion of actual gold, but also the body being transformed into some kind of subtle body. Here we have the influence of Henri Maspero, this very important French, early French sinologist, Joseph Needham again, an important British sinologist, and actually also Carl Jung, so thinking about these different influences. Um, the history of so-called Taoist yoga, which is a misnomer, um, the kind of major influence on this is this book called Taoist Yoga, Alchemy and Immortality by Lu Kuan Yu or Charles Luck, who you may have heard of. Um, this is a translation of the early 20th century Xingming Fajue Mingzhi, 
the illuminating uh, pointers to the methods and instructions of innate nature and life destiny. Um, and so this is actually an internal alchemy text, a Nadan text. It's not on Dao Yin. It's not on Yang Sheng. Uh, so I'll get into this in a moment. Um, thinking more about so-called Taoist yoga, this misnomer, sometimes in Western language, and especially English language publications, it refers to Nei Dan, which I'll talk about more towards the end in a moment. Um, so the so-called inner elixir. So if we're thinking about it comparatively, something like Kundalini or Tantric yoga might be a parallel. Also, sometimes it refers to Tao Yin, guided stretching. Uh, so thinking about postural hatha and even modern yoga. Sometimes it refers to Fang Zhong Shu, um, the bedchamber arts. So in again, in English language publications, sometimes you have people talking about so-called Taoist sexual yoga, which is a fiction. And so therefore, I have you could compare this to so-called tantric sex, right? So thinking about this kind of popular construction of these traditions. And then finally, sometimes when people talk about Taoist yoga, they mean qigong or qi exercises. Um, it's now part of the spiritual marketplace, including something called Tao yoga or healing Tao. Uh, this is associated with this kind of key figure, um, Chinese ethnically, but Thai nationally. Um, and, uh, so his system, sometimes called Healing Tao, and also this new form called Yin Yoga, which seems to come from Tao Yin practice. Um, so these are part of this larger movement of hybrid spirituality, what I would call spiritual colonialism, and then also spiritual capitalism. So thinking about the yoga industry. So it's of course quite dangerous for a sinologist right, to speak comparatively with so many Indologists in the room. Perhaps Professor James Mallinson or some of you might challenge or clarify my characterizations of the other side, which I welcome. So thinking a little bit about Dao Yin, this is a set of postures called the eight brocades or the eight section brocades. Um, it's a famous example of Dao Yin practice. It's contained in the 13th century Shoujan Shi Shu, the 10 books on cultivating perfection. And it's basically moving from the top right, so that's the first posture, down to the bottom left, uh, the eighth posture. So this is just to kind of show you an example of Dao Yin practice. Interestingly, Dao Yin is oftentimes located in a larger system of Yang Sheng or nourishing life practice, right? So you can see number four is Dao Yin. Um, what interests me about this particular list, just to maybe problematize some assumptions about what Tao Yin practice or what Yang Sheng practice is, is that you have number five, proper speech, and you have number 10, taboos and prohibitions. So thinking about being ethical as a form of health and longevity practice, um, thinking about the question of ethics in contemplative practice more broadly or in internal alchemy practice. A lot of times in internal alchemy systems, it's assumed that there's an ethical foundation. So you establish yourself in kind of ethical practice. Again, this might be compared to the Yoga Sutras, specifically the Yama, the abstentions or the moral restraints, and the Niyama, the ethical observances, the first and second of the so-called eight limbs. So just something to maybe be thinking about comparatively. So moving into alchemy, um, why Dan and Nei Dan? So Dan literally means the um, cinnabar. It's in this context, it usually is an abbreviation of Dan Sha, mercuric sulfide. Um, and then that becomes used more broadly to talk about pills or elixirs. Okay, so why Dan is the earlier tradition, um, the outer cinnabar or the outer pill. So this is external alchemy. This is literally compounding elixirs and ingesting them. So taking external substances and bringing them into the body. This begins in the early medieval period, um, specifically around the second century CE. Sometimes in English language publications, it's talked about as laboratory or operational alchemy, sometimes even proto-chemistry. So Joseph Needham in Science and Civilization in China kind of uses this language of um, imagining the development of science, right, in Chinese history and culture. So there are specific apparatus, there's paraphernalia, there's substances, there's processes involved in forming these elixirs, combining these different ingredients. 
You also have nadon, or the inner cinnabar or pill, so this is internal alchemy. It begins in the next period of Taoist history, the late medieval period around the 9th century CE. And this is where you find these references to subtle anatomy and physiology. There's a kind of psychosomatic transformation and rarefication that happens. And then the external alchemy language becomes incorporated in internal alchemy as a kind of symbol system. So I'm not going to cover a lot of this. This is just to give you a kind of sense. This is an example of one of the most famous elixirs uh, from this early medieval period, the, the elixir of great clarity, the Tai Ching Dan. Um, and so when you read these external alchemy texts, there's a lot of esoteric language where it's very difficult to decipher the specific ingredients. And so this is an attempt to kind of show you what these ingredients would be. And you can see some of them are unknown. So even with really deep philological work and looking at contemporaneous sources, it's very difficult to reconstruct the specific ingredients of the, specific ingredients of the elixir. Okay. Um, if you're interested in this, Joseph Needham has a lot on it. Um, there's also, um, Joseph Needham has published on it, Nathan Sivan, Fabrizio Pregadio, and Robert Campany to a lesser extent. So moving into internal alchemy, there are a lot of different types of Taoist meditation practice. So what I want to concentrate on with the rest of my time is internal alchemy or nadan. Interestingly, there's also a later form that comes up in the late imperial period um, that's called nudan female alchemy. So it's specifically for women. Um, and a lot of those texts were written by female masters for female students. And then they kind of think more about female embodiment. So Taoist internal alchemy, or um, you can start to kind of trace the history of this. Um, so you have proto nadan proto-internal alchemy in the early medieval period. It's documented in such influential texts as the Dadong Junjing, the perfect or perfected scripture on great profundity, and also the Huang Tingjing, the scripture on the yellow court. It becomes fully developed and integrated in the early medieval periods, the late Tang dynasty, so I mentioned the 9th to the 10th centuries. What happens in internal alchemy is a kind of stage-based practice aimed at complete psychosomatic transformation or immortality and transcendence xian in Taoist terms. What's interesting about internal alchemy in terms of the history of Taoist meditation is that it integrates the four other major types of meditation, often beginning and ending with quietistic meditation. It also incorporates a lot of other elements of traditional Chinese culture. Um, and another noteworthy thing about internal alchemy, which makes the academic study of it quite difficult, is that it oftentimes has esoteric uh, terminology and esoteric transmission, so usually requiring guidance under a spiritual elder or teacher. So this is a famous Taoist body map on your left called the Neijing Tu, the Diagram of Inner Pathways. It's a 19th century diagram. Um, and it basically um, synthesizes and integrates a lot of the earlier kind of Taoist body maps and a lot of the earlier kind of alchemical understanding of the person. So I'm not going to go through all this, but just to kind of show you one kind of key aspect um, that's maybe interesting for comparative purposes is thinking about the three uh, elixir fields, the Dan Tian. So the ocean of energy, the ocean of qi, uh, which is the lower, the navel, the scarlet palace, the middle, the heart, and niwan, which literally means the mud ball, um, the upper or the head, right? Yeah, so there's an interesting question about this. Is niwan um, literally kind of using a metaphor to talk about the emergence of a kind of lotus? Um, is it a transliteration of nirvana? Um, there's also kind of theories that it was a specific external alchemy ingredient. Okay, but you can see this in the image. Uh, so the ox herder in line with the kind of um, uh, uh, sphere of light, that's the navel region moving into the cow herd in the heart and then up into the head. Um, and then the weaving maiden with the um, flames is focusing on the kidneys. So how does this work in terms of alchemical substances and locations? You have vital essence usually associated, uh, this is your kind of core vitality usually associated with the kidneys, the qi, subtle breath or energy associated with the navel, and then spirit um, or shun associated with the heart and the head. Um, you also then get this very esoteric terminology. Um, so kind of mapping this out is a lot of the work that I do in terms of the reconstructed practice. 
Um, so thinking about these alchemical dyads or symbology. So for example, if um, in this particular system comes out of Chengen or Complete Perfection, one of the major movements that I've studied, but you get these kinds of references to mercury and lead. And the reason mercury is asterisk is Suzanne asked me about mercury. So what is mercury? Mercury is energy, is chi, right? What is lead in this case? And lead is innate nature or spirit. So you start to get these kinds of maps of personhood. Um, this is a representative example of a Nadan training regimen. This comes from the Dadan Jirjir, the direct pointers of the great elixir, which is a, probably like a 13th century text um, that's also associated with Chengen or complete perfection. Um, so one thing that's noteworthy about this is that it's a nine stage process. And then when you look at it, what's interesting also about this text is it's illustrated. Uh, so it has actual images, and then it describes the kind of stage-based process of alchemical transformation. Um, so one of the most well-known practices in internal alchemy is called the water wheel, the he che, or the celestial cycle, the jiu tian. Um, and then in English, a lot of times people refer to this as the microcosmic orbit. So this is depicting the torso. Um, the right side is the spine, the left side is the front of the torso. So these are the two major meridians uh, in the body from a Taoist perspective. Uh, the governing vessel going up the spine and the conception vessel usually going up the front center line of the torso, but it's reversed. So in this practice, you circulate energy up the spine and down the front center line of the body in a continuous cycle, and this creates this kind of energetic being. Um, so the Chinese, besides talking about the earth, basically in this case the perineum, the base of the torso, and the heaven, um, the head, it's also saying um, when you inhale, the, basically the energy advances and ascends, and once it gets to the head, then you exhale, it returns, and it descends. So this is what this, um, an example of this kind of internal alchemy process. So in conclusion, as I kind of look at these things um, and imagine like what kind of work needs to be done, um, some of this, and this is obviously work that I've done in more specialist publications, is thinking about the technical specifics of practice. So I think this is some of the things that will come out of this edited volume that we're working on. Um, thinking about the relationship between self, practice, and experience, so maybe we'll talk about this in the discussion, that there's a kind of composite view of the self that's informing internal alchemy, where you have to basically fuse all the different aspects of yourself into a transcendent spirit. Um, thinking about different conceptions of embodiment, and by embodiment, I don't just mean conceptions of the body. I mean the way in which we become manifest in the world. So do different traditions manifest differently in embodied form? And also, what's being transmitted through these different practices, through these different forms of practice? Um, I'm specifically interested in religiously committed and tradition-based practice, thinking about soteriological systems. Uh, so that is, what's the ultimate purpose of these practices? Why do people do them? Um, what do they imagine will happen? Um, but, and you can see from the opening of this, um, also being engaged with popular constructions of these traditions, right? Um, so imagining studies on the history of so-called Taoist yoga, which again is a misnomer, or yin yoga, part of hybrid spirituality. Also thinking about popular culture and new religious movements, including mindfulness and Western yoga. And then meta research on research. So for example, doing studies of Budo neuroscience, like how has Budo neuroscience come to kind of appear? Um, so from my perspective, it's also important to investigate intellectual genealogies, popular constructions, and contexts of reception. Thank you very much. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Suzanne very much and uh, the Ayur Yoga Project for uh, inviting me to give this talk. I'm slightly uh, daunted because I know very little about alchemy, I have to say, I've, and as, as you will discover in, in, the, in the process of my talk. But I've had, a, yeah, I've had to mug up fairly quickly recently, not just because of this talk, but because of recent developments in my uh, 
research work, which I'm going to talk about now. I'm going to be rather more specific than Lewis was in that wonderful overview of the Taoist uh, alchemical outer and inner tradition. Um, so yes, I'm really looking forward to the discussion as well, and for anyone who's got any uh, suggestions to, uh, uh, to, to um, you know, uh, on, on my conclusions. Um, yes, and as I said, I'm slightly daunted because there's a lot of people in the audience who know quite a bit more about alchemy than I do. But my conclusion, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll say it now. Well, I'll, I'll move on to the first slide, which, so Lewis also mentioned this book by uh, David Gordon White, which, of course, you know, has, uh, has impinged upon his thinking. For, for me, working within the Indic tradition on, uh, on yoga and Hatha yoga in particular, it came out <clears throat> just after I started my PhD work on a text called the Ketri Vidya. So it was a sort of, you know, it was a delight to have this sort of treasure house. I think if those of you who don't know his work, it's um, full of fantastic, fascinating details, but sometimes strung together in, uh, you know, not altogether. Not, not, I mean, it's, as many of you will know, I disagree with many of his theses about many things. And also on this, in this book as well, the main thesis which I've written there, excuse me. <coughs> the Rasa Siddhas, so those are alchemical adepts uh, within the Indian tradition who sort of flourished perhaps from the 9th to the 14th centuries, but then continued on. And the Nath Siddhas, uh, the Nath lineage of, of ascetics in, amongst whom uh, Hatha Yoga is thought to have developed and who continue to flourish to, the, to this day. If they were not one and the same people, so what he's saying is the pra practitioners of alchemy, external alchemy, and Hatha Yoga, if they were not one and the same people, were at least closely linked in their practice. The balance of this book is devoted to, to proving this thesis. Now, uh, and one of the texts he cites in the book to support this approach is the uh, text called the Ketri Vidya, which is the text that I edited for my PhD, which I was working on when the book came out. And I concluded from looking at that text and other Hatha Yoga texts, just in a note, I think it's a, you know, a note in, in the back of my, thesis, of my PhD that this was not really, well, it, I mean, he's, he's slightly hedging it, we're at least closely linked in their practice. What I'm gonna conclude here is that in fact, the practices were, were not associated in any way. Um, so, and the reasons for this is a few, there's a few kind of textual instances which support this opinion of mine. Here's one from a text called the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, which we're currently editing as part of the Hatha Yoga project. Now, I haven't given you the full translation, but it says in the first stage of yoga practice, various things, various problems might arise, various obstacles, one of which is the practice of alchemy, Dhatuvada, basically the sort of science of working with metals is literally how that's translated. I think that means alchemy. And maybe some of the specialists here would disagree, but with Professor Sanderson, that's the conclusion we came to. And other, so it's associated, what's the other thing? Laziness, associating with rogues, mantra practice. So this text is very down on, uh, on tantric practice as well. And searching for buried treasure, which is another sort of, one of these magical sciences that often crop up in, in tantric texts. So that's sort of, you know, that's clearly, you know, disparaging it in some way. Uh, in the Ketri Vidya itself, it doesn't teach any alchemical practice at all, despite what White says in Alchemical Body. Um, but here I think it's kind of, Trying, trying to trump alchemical practice by sort of using, uh, it's using alchemical terminology, but for a physical practice. It's rather bizarre physical practices, which, uh, as far as I'm aware, are not, not still carried out. But rubbing, so mardana, this is a, a technique, one of the 18 sanskaras, one of the techniques used on, uh, on mercury in alchemical practice. Rubbing the body with amrita fluids, which emerge from various bodily orifices, brings about purification of the channels, loss of wrinkles and gray hair, freedom from disease, and a long tongue, because a long tongue is necessary for the key practice of the text. So I think there, in some way, it's sort of, you know, it, perhaps, you know, there's, there's a nod at alchemy here, and it's, but it's sort of relocating it to the body. But then in other texts, a couple, I've got a, there's a couple of texts from a similar period, going back to the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra and the Shiva Sangata. Now, this one really seems to me to be saying, we yogis can do, can do your alchemical stuff just with our own feces and urine, as you can see. Malamutra pralepena lohadinam suvarnata. So by rubbing uh, feces, i.e. Of the, of the yogi and, and urine onto uh, iron and other metals, we can turn it into gold. Okay, so that seems to me, and that's, this is just one of, this comes in a long list of various siddhis, various powers that will arise if you get your yoga practice right. So, uh, so at this point in my work, and this is sort of 20 years ago or more, 
I kind of thought that, okay, al alchemy and hatha yoga are not really related in, in, uh, uh, very closely at all. Um, but then recently in the course of the Hatha Yoga Project, I've been working on this text called the Amrita Siddhi. It's the first text to teach uh, the, the physical practices of yoga. And many of you will have heard me talk at, at length about it here many times. It's a fascinating text for many reasons. Uh, and it's made me have to sort of, you know, rethink my ideas about lots of things, not least because we've realized that it was composed by Buddhists. So I've had to have a sort of crash course in tantric Buddhism, which is the milieu in which it was composed. But also, and I've, I've been working on, on this text now for probably 15 years or something, but it made great strides in the last few years, not only because of the discovery that it was written by Buddhists, but also just in the last, about sort of, when was it? In September, there was a workshop we had in, uh, in Italy where we read the text. And it was just after that, actually, that I had this breakthrough that a, a key to understanding a lot of the terminology in it was alchemy, was Rasa Shastra, because a lot of the, uh, the, the, the terminology within the text is... is, is uh, derived from alchemical practice. So I've listed uh, pretty much all of them here. So various techniques. Um, and I've had to do a lot of digging around. There's a, there's a wonderful book in German, a kind of uh, encyclopedia or glossary of alchemical terms by Oliver Helwig, which has proved extremely useful. Um, and so there, there are these te techniques, terms that are applied to what you do either to the breath in yogic practice or to semen, because the retention of semen in, uh, is, is kind of central to the practice in, in this text. Uh, the things that you do to the breath, they will affect semen and vice versa. So you're not always completely clear what's, what, you're, what you're acting upon. Um, but the, so the, the terms of Mahabandha, binding, somehow that's kind of uh, a way of stopping mercury as well, but it's, it's, it's associated with stopping the breath or, or sealing the breath. Mahavedha, is, these are the two of the key physical practices within the text. Veda actually has meanings beyond alchemy as well, but it, it's a key term in, in alchemical practice, meaning uh, the transmutation of, of, of a substance by uh, applying specially prepared mercury to it. It's a very complicated process. Always. There's 18 processes, and I really haven't understood them all. And I'm not quite sure of the translations here either, but there's this other one, marana, which literally means killing something. And apparently, uh, if I've understood Helwig right, but he's, always, he's often not completely clear. It's sort of calcination. Again, it's one of these 18 practices that you have to do to perfect mercury, to solidify it. Um, jarana, assimilation. Charana, another form of assimilation. And then murchana, coagulation. So these are all things that, in this text, it says you do to the breath or to semen, bindu, as it's called. And then not only are these processes taught, but also... Uh, these, there are these terms used, which again, this, this one here, the, the first one on the right, samputta, this is a real sort of key to me when I discovered what that meant, because it wasn't making much sense at all in the, in the text, and I'll come back to that, but that, this is an alchemical uh, sort of crucible. Uh, Ghatta too means, literally just means a pot, it's a very common Sanskrit word, but also within alchemical texts, it's used as the vessel for which you do your, uh, do your, your alchemical cooking in. And yantra, too, is, is, a, is, a, is often used in alchemical works to describe the devices which you use. And now I think my next... Ah, yes. There, there's a, this, is, um, this is... I mean, I could have drawn up lots of examples from the text, but this is a, 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 a significant verse which is actually found in lots of subsequent texts, applying specifically here to... I put in the square brackets, bindu, because it comes in the chapter about bindu, i.e. semen. Uh, thickened, murchito, murchitaha, uh, it destroys or gets rid of disease. Bound, badaha, so these are key terms of alchemy. Uh, it leads one towards, makes one become a, a sky rover, a kichara. A linaha, I, that's, this is also like dissolved. This is also a, an alchemical term. It bestows all, um, all siddhis, all special powers. And nishchalaha, I don't think that's a specifically an alchemical term, but it, you know, it means not moving. So this is, again, something you want to do to... Uh, to mercury within in alchemical practice. And if it's when it's completely still, uh, then it bestows liberation. OK. And so this is, yeah, Samputta. Hel Helvig's book is very hard to navigate. And I only actually, after a lot of time searching around, I only came across this one quite recently, in the last month or so. But the, the key practice of the text of the Amrita Siddhi, at the end of it, well, it's the, the second of the three practices, the Mahabandha. It says, this is the Samputta Yoga, okay? And I really didn't understand what was going on for a long time. 
but now it's clear because the, the practice involves applying a lock, a bunda at the top of the central channel and at the bottom, okay? And then you've got the fire. Uh, you're trying to raise the fire or you're applying the fire. At, 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 uh, you're trying to make it blaze up at the bottom of the central channel as well. And it turns out, as we can see here from... Uh, this is Google Translate. I'm afraid my German's not brilliant, but I've uh, uh, smoothed it over, I think. A sambuta, a sphere, is a closed system composed of two vessels in which substances are heated. In most cases, the two components are cup-shaped vessels, the first of which is filled with a reagent. The upper vessel is placed upside down on the lower one, and the joint is sealed. So this seems to be... So the idea in the Amrita Siddhi is you've got these two locks being applied at top and bottom with the, the fire underneath. And then what happens in the next part of the practice, the third one, the Mahaveda, there are these three central practices, Mahamudra. Mudra, strangely enough, doesn't seem to be uh, an important term in, in Indian alchemy. Uh, you would have thought it might do because it means a seal, so it would sort of make sense in certain cases, but I haven't found instances of it within alchemical text. Perhaps someone can uh, correct me here. So once you've done that, once you've sealed the breath within this samputta, within this chamber, which elsewhere is called a ghatta, and I'll come back to that, then you lift the body up and you tap the, the, body, the base of the spine with the heels, and that makes the, the, the breath burst up and through the upwards along the central channel. So I think the idea, you know, as you can see here with this samputta, there's a pipe at the top. So it's, if you get it right, you can make the, uh, the, the, the bindu and the breath uh, flow upwards. Okay, so we've got next. Now, what, so, but what, what my argument, really the, my main argument this evening is, as, as I hinted at the beginning, is I don't think that the alchemical practice is key to the yogic practice. I think they're just using it as a metaphor, okay? And it's very interesting, in fact, that this seems to appear at exactly the same time as the uh, Nedan practices that you said are at ninth. Well, this text is probably 11th century, so maybe just after. So maybe this is something we can talk about, but maybe there's some influence there. But we have much earlier in Indic sources, we have a very a similar yogic practice of, of what you do with the, with the breath. So I don't, I'll, I'll read most of this, I think, the Patanjala Yoga Shastra, Kaundinya's Pancharatha Bhashya uh, on the Pashupata Sutra and several tantric texts. And also I'll, I'll add here, so this is from uh, my book with Mark Singleton, Roots of Yoga. Uh, and I think in the note also we draw attention to instances in the Mahabharata, so going back, you know, 2,000 years, to uh, these uh, instances of what's called Chodana, okay, which seems to be some forceful eruption of the breath through the central channel. And those texts that I mentioned... Um, they teach that holding the breath results in udghata, or eruption. Um, and, yes, so Bhojaraja, one of the commentators on the Patanjala Yoga Shastra, 11th century, defines udghata as the wind striking the head when it has been propelled upwards from its source in the navel. And then we have Vasudeva, Somde Vasudeva, uh, he defines it from, when, from looking at Shaiva Tantric texts, as uh, the sensation of a spontaneous upward surge of vital energy brought on in the early stages of self-induced asphyxiation. And then it, just as the breath does in the, uh, in the Amrita Siddhi, it then pierces a sequence of knots in the, in the central channel. Now, so, so what I'm saying is that this, this notion of, uh, of, 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 making, of forcing the breath into the central channel and propelling it upwards is, is much older than our Hatha Yoga text. And also, what I think is particularly significant here, we see this, a text called the Dharma Putrika, which I, uh, I think is, is being looked at a bit, perhaps, in the Aya Yoga project as well. But it, I came across this reference there, where it seems to be describing almost the same practice, but it's, slight, again, slightly earlier than the Amrita Siddhi, probably 9th or 10th century, is that the latest dating, I think, something like that? Yeah. Okay, even earlier. So it comes before the Amrita Siddhi. And you'll see here, so the key, the key term here is um, vartuli krutya. So the idea is that, you, that, that, that the yogin, uh, he utters om, um, and he then forcefully draws up his breaths, which are situated in the lower part of the body, uh, concentrates them in the heart, vartuli krutya, and you know, made them into a ball. So we have the same idea parallel with the, you know, the samputta idea of this sort of round chamber in the center of the body, and then says another om, and uh, propels the breath upwards to the skull. Okay, so this comes at least two or three centuries probably before the Amrita Siddhi, seems to be saying exactly the same thing, but in, in, in different terminology. Um, and now along, same line, along similar lines as well, uh, we had Linda Hess here came to speak at the, um, for the Centre of Yoga Studies. She gave a wonderful talk on 
yogic references in Kabir, the, what do we think, is he 16th century, 15th, 16th century uh, uh, sant from, from North India, who's, a lot of whose poems uh, survive in, in old Hindi. And she, she talked about one poem, or maybe it was afterwards when we were chatting, but in uh, the, the old Hindi poems attributed to Kabir and Goraknath and also other saints, they, I've been looking at them a lot recently because they seem to really reproduce the yoga of the Amrita Siddhi. One of the you know, key things about the Amrita Siddhi's yoga is that it doesn't, it's, it's, you know, it's early Hatha yoga before uh, we see the overlaying of Kundalini and the chakras and so forth. And the, the, the yoga as taught in Kabir and, and almost all of uh, Goraknath's Hindi poems as well is very, very similar. But here, but it, they never repeat this alchemical metaphor. And what Kabir has a few times, I haven't found it in, in Gorak's poems, is uh, this ila pingala bharti kinhi brahma agni parajari. So that um, having made from the ida and pingala, so these are the two central channels, made a bharti, which is a, um, a, a, a still for distilling alcohol. Okay? So that's what's going on here. Then brahma agni parajari, ignite the fire. Okay, so the, the, you've got the so the, yeah these Hindi poems also very often go on about the Brahmagni at the base of the um, base of the central channel as being key to yogic practice. So here the metaphor, rather than being the alchemical one, we find in the Amrita Siddhi is is of a you know a, a, a still for making alcohol. I found this picture online. I haven't been able to. I think this is these are for sale from somewhere in America. I haven't been able to find a good picture of a of an Indian uh, sort of desi alcohol still. But this seems to be the idea. Of, of what's going on in, in Kabir. Um, and again, so, and then what seems to happen is I look at a couple of instances here. So for a few hundred years after the Amrita Siddhi, the text is, is used in, 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 in later works. Uh, and, for, and, and I'll show you an example after this one, but where they clearly know what's going on. But here in the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, so when I, when I first translated this text, and if I was working on this text, uh, and we were reading it here at SOAS, there's four stages to the yoga taught in the Amrita Siddhi and in this text, the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, it starts off with Aramba, and then the second stage is called Ghatta, okay, so which is, at first glance, you know, means pot, but it didn't, doesn't seem to make any sense at all, and that's what, and the, it's explained in the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra as not meaning pot at all, they kind of derive it from, there's a sort of more obscure meaning of the word, or a more obscure root of ghat. Ghatate is the verb, meaning just to sort of exist or be active. Okay, so I was then translating it as the action stage. And I think in Roots of Yoga, wherever ghata, the ghata stage appears, I translate it as, or we, we translate it as action. But actually, I think it's now clear that when it first appears in the Amrita Siddhi, it's meaning an alchemical chamber, because ghata is a very key term in, in, it crops up a lot in alchemical text, but it then seems to be put aside. And then uh, here, the, the, the first sort of non-Buddhist text to teach Hatha Yoga, which borrows directly, borrows a few verses from the Amrita Siddhi, uh, is a text called the Amaraga Prabodha, uh, which um, Jason and I have, have, have been editing. Oh, sorry, Jason's, Jason's editing it, but I've been reading it a lot with him. Um, and there's one verse in particular, which it was only thanks to understanding these alchemical metaphors that we, we've finally sort of worked out what it means. And here, it's the first verse given here. Rujvi Bhutta Tata Shakti Kundali Sahasa Bhavit. So the, the, the goddess Kundalini, the, the divine energy Shakti Kundalini, suddenly becomes straight. And then, Tada Sa Maranavasta Jayate Dviputashraya. So she attains this state of Marana, which as we've seen is a kind of alchemical term. I think just means she, she stops, she remains uh, steady. Dviputasraya. Now, this was really uh, confusing for a long time, but Dviputa, now we realize, is um, another term for Samputa. It means a double chamber. It means uh, something made from two chambers. A putta is a chamber, so this is two, two puttas together. Okay, then it makes sense when you have that alchemical key to it. Um, the same verse is then found in the Hatha Pradipika, and I suspect that Swatmarama, the author of the Hatha Pradipika, which is a couple of hundred years later, he probably knew what was going on, because as we'll see in a minute, I'll talk about that a bit more, but the Hatha Pradipika seems to have been composed in an alchemical milieu. But much later on, we have the commentary of Brahmananda on the Hatha Pradipika, I think it's 1837, and he, when he's analyzing this compound, uh, he, he says that the puttas, the dwi putta, uh, are the, the left and right channels, the Ida and Pingala, and it doesn't really make any sense at all. So this is what was you know, confusing us for a long time. How can we apply that to 
to this to this verse because it really really doesn't make much sense to say that the Gundalini has stopped has attained a state of death in the nostrils effectively is what what he was saying so it's now now thanks to this uh, you know alchemical key that we've been able to unlock that but the, so my point is that that the the Amrita Siddhi was composed in this uh, milieu in which alchemical terminology prevailed and it's closely related in fact to the Kala Chakra Tantra which also is is the only tantric Buddhist text which which uh, treats which um, uses alchemical terminology but again it's not talking about external alchemy it's only talking about internal alchemy um, and this yeah I'm wrapping up soon I'm aware that we might be overrunning but um, yes in the Hatha Pradipika just to sort of go back to the point I made about it being written in an alchemical milieu or to some extent it lists the the, the author Swat Marama lists 29 siddhas or adepts uh, who who he says have broken the rod of time Kala Dandam uh, by means of Hatha Yoga Hatha Yoga Prabhavataha I think it is um, of whom some of them are very obscure some of them are very famous but there are seven of whom we can identify as uh, masters of alchemy they're known from from having composed texts or in uh, legends from this period and so forth as alchemists and the texts ascribed to them are nothing to do with hatha yoga at all so it's clear that I mean I think what what we can see is that in this early period in fact the period that that white was referring to perhaps in his book that these uh, yogis and alchemists really were closely associated but I think the practices were distinct um, so I'm gonna I've got a couple more slides just to wrap up because we can see that alchemy has has persisted I mean the Ayurveda people know much more about this than I do but the practice of alchemy or Rasa Shastra has persisted in India so here you see this I found this online you can buy this is this lingo is made from solidified alchemy a, a solidified mercury and in fact I've got a, a sort of egg shape, a sort of lingo a kind of more an iconic linger at home that I've had for about 20 25 years I was rather worried when I got it that it might be poisonous and I carried it around for a while but it's so far touch wood it hasn't finished me off um, I left it at home I, I meant to bring it in I'm afraid but I left it at home by mistake um, so yes so alchemy has continued in India but I think the the trajectory of yoga practice has has they've 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 come apart I mean there are still some Nath yogis who are alchemical practitioners but very few um, so yes just to return to my main point before I ah well to, yes to, to you know, return to what white says in his book the Rasa Siddhas and Nath Siddhas if they were not one and the same people were at least closely linked in their practice I think they were closely linked I think they interacted quite a lot but I don't think they were practicing together um, that's it thank you very much so um, I, I think we're going to go over from seven o'clock maybe maybe like 20 minutes or so um, I'm going to give them a chance to 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 talk to each other but first I want to um, thank them both for the presentations and it's a really nice example of the really detailed um, uh, translations and the problems of translation and, and understanding what's happening over time um, in order to make the more general overviews that um, Lewis so, so, so really helpfully did because we're much less familiar with Taoism here um, before I invite you, in terms of the Aereo projects, one of the linking threads is what gives you longer longevity? What, what, what do you do for longevity? What do you do for better health? And this idea of immortality. So in, I know this is like uh, another entire hour long lecture for each of you, but in like just, just two minutes, can you talk about ideas about why you might want a healthy body, why you might want to be immortal and what they mean for the traditions you work with? I know that's a horrible, impossible question, but it's a linking thread between everything that the Aereo project's looking at in terms of health and longevity and alchemy. And um, well, I mean, I was very stimulating listening to Lewis because we really, I mean, what I've again been realizing over the course of the Hatha Yoga project is that we do see a real turning point around, you know, with these first Hatha Yoga texts where it's the first time a the physical practices are taught but b that we get this kind of body positive approach to to yoga practice um you know previously ascetics were doing you know more, less uh, less sort of savory things to their bodies as far as we can tell but now um yeah longevity looking after the body and but also in particular jivan mukti um liberation while living becomes a kind of a central aim of of, of the of the practices taught 
Um, yeah, and I, you know, I can't help but think that there are certain things, I mean, I could talk, maybe I'll leave it at that, there's just things I want to ask you, specifics about what you said, but maybe you can say a bit more about. Um, immortality is never quite explained, but it does, no, I, it, it, no in fact, at the end of the Amrita Siddhi, it says that there are uh, these, these Siddha yogis of, are, are, um, you know, uh, is it Am Amrita Siddhi or Amaragra Prabodha? Anyway, we do have this idea of, of uh, yogis living forever up in the Himalayas, you know, having a great time wandering around so yeah i guess the idea is that they do live forever in a body or disembodied <clears throat> that's not very detailed it's not very clear yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> yeah so the sounds okay okay sorry i have a strong voice so i never know if i'm <clears throat> bombarding you um so on the chinese side i mean there tends to be this kind of spectrum from vitality to longevity to immort immortality and um on a kind of traditional internal alchemy context, um, basically, and this is quite kind of important, but also detailed, you have, you have this composite self. So your fate as a human being from a kind of traditional Taoist perspective is to dissipate into the universe when you die. That's the fate of ordinary human beings. So if you don't want to dissipate into the universe, you have to actually go through an alchemical process to transmute yourself and form a, what, a transcendent spirit. So it's psychosomatic, um, but, and maybe this didn't come out as clearly in the presentation, but it had, there's an energetic view of the personhood that's psychosomatic. So the view inside of internal alchemy is you can actually transmute the physical, quote unquote, into the spiritual. Um, and so in some alchemical texts, they talk about like the disappearance of bones and things like this, um, that you will have very distinct kind of energetic transformative experiences that indicate that you're basically rarefying yourself and eventually on some level becoming a god. So immortality is beyond vitality and longevity. Um, it's basically, in the, at least in the kind of traditional early or late medieval text, it's talking about the formation of a transcendent spirit. And only if you are successful in this process of transmutation, will you have personal post-mortem existence? No one else will. And even if you do it, you might not be successful. So that's where you get that kind of stage-based map. Of, and they'll even say things like, you have to do it sequentially, and if something disrupts your practice, you have to go back to the beginning. You can't pick it up on, like, you got to stage six, and then, you know, you got your spouse kind of told you you had to do the laundry, and so then you forgot to do your practice, and it's like, no, you just go back to stage one. What, can, I, can I just, about him, what does, am I on? What, what does um, post-mortem existence entail? Then? Well, this is where it gets quite complicated. So the, I think, the, again, the kind of standard account is that there are these Taoist immortal realms, these sacred realms, um, where you ascend up into the heaven. So the first um, slide, the title slide, where it showed the yang spirit going out through the crown of the head. Um, so that's the, that's the kind of transcendent spirit that's formed through internal alchemy practice. And a lot of times in the systems, you train yourself basically to, while you're alive, sending out the yang spirit through your head to go visit the sacred realm. So when you die, you know where to go. And then as this kind of transcendent spirit, you ascend up into the Tao of sacred realms. But there are other conceptions of it. So this, you were talking about, I think, the difficulty of deciphering the language. A lot of times in the Taoist case, it's difficult to decipher what actually, what happens in the end. Because some of the texts use this language of kind of disappearance into the void. So it sounds like more of a kind of unitive mystical state. But when you start looking at the text, the way they describe it is, um, that's the kind of traditional language, but they're still envisioning personal post-mortem survival. Uh, so it gets very complicated to try to figure out what is the end goal, what happens supposedly if you complete this alchemical process. Yeah. So I could say more, and it gets even more complicated, unfortunately. So. Do you have a question? Well, I've got loads of, and I'm more, and now more convinced than ever that there was sort of cross fertilization, or at least I think maybe, well, not, not even that necessarily, but um, the practices were coming from Taoism in, into India. One thing I, that really made my ears prick up was when you were talking about the two channels coming down from the top of the body, because that, 
that we have that idea in the Amrita Siddhi as well. And there's one channel that's for, for semen as, you know, as such, for, for procreation, and the other one is nourishing the body with a sort of vital fluid. Is that? Well, it's interesting. So I, I don't know the Indian case, right? Um, but in the Chinese case, in the Taoist case, Jing, the first of the internal three substances, is connected to um, seminal fluids in men and menstrual blood in women. Um, but it's not just that. So that's a kind of um, fluid manifestation of the deeper layer of vitality. So this is what I'm kind of wondering mm. in the Indian case. Um, do they really mean literally semen? This is, I get picked up on this a lot for you know, translating it as such. The idea is it's called bindu, which has a long, the term has a long heritage within the tantric traditions as sort of as the point, for, a point of light from which everything emanates and so forth. So it's a very heavily laden term and you know, I, we had a similar discussion yesterday in the workshop about the term rajas within the, the text, which is the sort of fe the feminine principle. And you know, I've now you know, come around to translating neither of them and just put, put Bindu and rajas with a capital letter, yeah, because they've got too much right. going on to... So, so in this case, the idea is the transmutation of Jing, of vital essence, into qi, into energy, or subtle breath, into shun, into spirit... Um, and so that's the transmutation process. Mm -hmm. But normally, you in most of these systems, they tend to be more monastic. Um, and so normally what happens is you conserve Jing. Mm -hmm. So how you do that, and this is where the female alchemy shows up, and this usually is where people get disturbed about Taoism because their practice is to stop menstruation. Oh. Okay. Which, is, which logically makes sense because menstrual blood in women is associated with Jing. Well, if men can just stop having sex and stop having, like, seminal emission, but women can't, then there's a kind of logical problem with the system when you really start addressing female embodiment from this perspective. So how do you conserve Jing in a man's body? How do you conserve Jing in a woman's body so that you have the kind of foundation to transmute yourself into these more and more subtle kinds of dimensions of yourself? Mm. Um, so I, I think... That's complicated in the sense of there are other ways to think about Jing, but that's one of the standard ways, is like literally seminal um, fluids in men, menstrual blood in women. You know? So there are other ways of addressing that from a Taoist perspective, but in an internal alchemy context, um, it's usually a kind of conservation model. You have to start with some kind of like psychosomatic integration of yourself before you go through the transmutation mm -hmm. process. Again, that's ex paralleled in the in the Hatha Yoga text, in particular the Amr Amrita Siddhi, extremely closely. In fact, the text itself, Amrita Siddhi, seems to have been written as a kind of claim on on these tantric yoga practice. An internalization by a celibate monastic mm -hmm. tradition as rejecting the, the the sort of ejaculatory sexual practices of of, of Vajrayana. So get, I mean, the parallels are just stronger and stronger. Yeah, so I mean, I guess if I could ask you, um, at one point in your talk, you said you didn't see <clears throat> the alchemy and the yoga being integral to each other. And I'm kind of curious what you mean, because to me it looks quite alchemical, but maybe I'm looking at it from an internal alchemy perspective and you're thinking more of an external alchemy perspective. Yes, yeah, so, and, and uh, yeah, and, I think, and, and now I think about it more, and thinking about the parallels with the with the the, the Taoist traditions. Perhaps this in you know, a more developed uh, notion of actual internal alchemy came influenced this yogic practice, and so yeah, the whole ideas did originate within alchemy, and then that was forgotten later on. Rather than, I mean, and then combining with this this the, the breath practices that I was talking about as well. But yeah, the. Yeah, I was just curious of the distinction, because I think in the Taoist case, the dis you couldn't really separate out the practice from the alchemical. Like, it w you, you, I think you used the language of it was a mere metaphor. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know what that means. Okay. Right. But, but, you, but you see what I mean? When I, when I, I, when I showed it in, in Kabir, when it, he uses a different metaphor. Right. Right, so, and in the Dharma Putra, cover comes earlier, and uses just just says it's a sphere, mm -hmm. but talking about the, a similar practice. But then I suppose those texts, well, the the um, Kabir is, is, but the Dharma Putra is not talking about the Rajas and the Bindu, so it hasn't got that kind of alchemical mm. overlay. You know, I need to think deeper. And we definitely need to talk about this more because, well, I think it, it, as I've said many times over the years, it requires a huge project, I think, to try and... Yeah.